Actually Speaking, Episode 5, The Human Nature of Prejudice. Want to know how to live skeptically and still have friends? So do I. Let's figure it out. Actually Speaking, a podcast that explores the human side of skepticism, critical thinking, and the skills we need to make it through the day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 5 of Actually Speaking, a podcast that sets the science aside and explores the human side of skepticism. My name is Mike Mraz, and today we'll be taking a closer look at the human nature of prejudice. If you've been listening to this podcast since the beginning, one thing you'll soon realize about me is that in tackling difficult issues, I like to pull back and get perspective. I personally find that when we're too close to a problem, hacking away at the symptoms and only looking at the superficial conflict, we risk losing both objectivity and effectiveness. Our biases often come into full play, and we fail to see what really needs to be done to resolve conflicts. Areas in which perspective is crucial to our ability to navigate challenges in a constructive manner are the topics of race, gender, equality, diversity, etc. These are all areas of human prejudice and discrimination where we almost always find ourselves hacking away at the symptoms and only occasionally striking at the heart of the issue. Now, don't get me wrong, symptom hacking is very often a necessary means of intervention and serves as an effective catalyst and starting point for change. But today, I want to challenge you to go a little further, dig a little deeper, and look at these issues collectively in order to see them in a slightly different way. Let's simplify things a bit by collectively labeling the issues of gender, race, sexual identity, and so forth as simply prejudice and explore the possibility that understanding and accepting our own human nature, our own tendencies for prejudice, just might make an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. The best place to start is with one simple fact, and that is that we are all prejudice. We're all capable of racism, discrimination, bigotry, sexism, ageism, and the list goes on. It's not an aspect of ourselves we can cure or turn off. There's a reason there are so many isms, and that's because there are so many ways our prejudice can manifest itself. But these are just the symptoms of a larger process. Understanding our human tendency for prejudice is where we really need to focus our attention if we want some constructive solutions. Now, the fact that prejudice is part of our human nature isn't always a bad thing. Evolution has hardwired our decision-making process for a more primitive time and an environment that no longer exists. But the tendencies remain. For me, looking at the evolutionary nature of prejudice is just as important and useful as the evolutionary impact on biology. Prejudice is a byproduct of a very basic survival instinct to generalize. As humans, we need to simplify information in order to more efficiently make decisions. In our past, this quick decision-making ability was crucial to our safety and survival. The ability to generalize kept us from having to relearn the dangers of fire, which plants are poisonous or which animals were predators. We are hardwired through evolution to simplify data, make assumptions, and apply those assumptions to new situations in order to survive. These tendencies are still part of who we are today and still guide our decision making, and in many cases serve the same beneficial purpose of survival and safety. But the world, environment, and social interactions have significantly changed, and as we interact with people, our natural tendency to generalize often shows itself in the form of prejudice. When we look at the world today, we can see that our human nature is something that we are very much aware of in some ways, while not so much in others. For example, we generally accept without question that within a society, order will not occur spontaneously. Sure, there's a natural state of order, survival of the fittest, but I'm talking about a more civilized state of order in which safety and the common good are maintained. The beneficial state of order is achieved through the formation of some form of government a system of laws and a means of enforcement. It's certainly not perfect, but it keeps us relatively safe, fed, and healthy. Without some form of governance, we'd likely devolve back into some post-apocalyptic state where survival of the fittest would be the natural way of things. It's an aspect of our human nature that we know intuitively and we rarely question. If we took away stop signs, people would crash. Stop enforcing laws and we would see crime rates skyrocket. We know and accept this intuitively. So we keep a system of laws and enforcement in place to constantly keep in check these aspects of our human nature which must always be balanced in order to keep us safe. We see this acceptance of our human nature in other ways as well, trivial ways, 
but important nonetheless. Biologically, we make sure to have plenty of restrooms in as many locations as possible. We could just assume that people would be responsible enough to go before they leave the house, but we realize that isn't likely. We could assume that teenagers would heed the wisdom of their parents and not get into trouble. But we place curfews, we arrange for supervision, and we ground when necessary. Those last two are certainly simple, silly examples, but my point is that there are many aspects of our life where we accept the reality of our human nature and take the appropriate precautions to keep those tendencies under control or minimized. And we rarely believe that they will simply go away, can be fixed or turned off like a light switch. So what happens when we fail to acknowledge our basic human nature? Well, there are a variety of ways in which this happens. These are usually situations where our beliefs, rather than facts, guide our positions and decision making. One of my favorite examples of this is the politically or religiously motivated pledge of sexual abstinence. There is nothing wrong with wanting a child to practice restraint in their sexual development, limit unintended pregnancies, or minimize the risk of STDs. Nothing at all. But how we go about encouraging that self-discipline makes all the difference. Denying our human nature in the process only promotes ignorance and makes us far more likely to fail. In the case of the abstinence-only pledge, what is happening is that we are ignoring a very basic human aspect of who we are. We are sexual beings biologically wired to function in natural ways in order to procreate and propagate our species. Now, there may be aspects of this that are socially awkward and uncomfortable, but that doesn't change the human nature we all share, and denying that human nature only promotes ignorance. If a teacher wants their students to do well on a test, they can do one of two things. They can educate them, or they can give them the test answers. We don't give answers because we want kids to actually learn. When abstinence is advocated, it bypasses learning, and kids never learn how to manage their emotions, use good judgment, think critically in their decision-making, practice self-control, learn personal responsibility, or understand basic personal health issues, all because we refuse to acknowledge a very basic and simple fact of our human nature, that we are all sexual beings. Now, this plays itself out over and over again in many things that we do in life when we deny basic elements of ourselves in order to support our preconceived notions or desires for who we are. Prejudice is no different. As skeptics, we value knowledge, objectivity, informed decision-making, and critical thinking. We often see this situation so clearly in terms of human sexuality, but not so well in terms of human prejudice. In this area, it's all too easy and common to make a definitive claim of non-prejudice. End of discussion. Or take the other extreme and claim to not recognize differences among us and adopt a colorblind or gender-free perspective. These claims may be well-intentioned, but when we turn our backs on our own human nature, we're choosing to look the other way at aspects of ourselves that we don't want to see. We diminish an issue to black and white, and very often only perpetuate the problem by disengaging from the solution. So why is it so hard for people to accept their own natural tendency for prejudice? Why do we attribute it to others but rarely ourselves? Why do we think that, if present, it's something that can be fixed, turned off, or somehow eliminated? Well, personally, I think the denial of prejudice is simply a very powerful but ordinary bias, which we find very hard to overcome. Much like a creationist refuses to accept our evolutionary origins or a psychic seeking to elevate themselves above the ordinary, we have a natural tendency to want to perceive ourselves as better than we actually are. And how we define better is different for each of us. Looking at ourselves honestly can be messy, sobering, and uncomfortable, so we tend to avoid it. So what happens? Well, this is where our biases and desire for how we want to perceive ourselves comes into conflict with the realities of our human nature. People who accept their natural tendency for prejudice are much better prepared to deal with it. As skeptics, we constantly question things in order to learn, grow, and expand our knowledge. As humans, we need to constantly question our behaviors and actions in order to learn more about our prejudices and behave in an equitable manner towards others. Equality requires vigilance. We need to apply critical thinking inward to ourselves as well as the world around us. As human beings, we have natural limitations that we need to constantly be aware of. We need to keep them in check and balanced, because when we don't, when we come out and say, I am not racist, I am not sexist, I am not prejudiced, in a very definitive manner, we essentially stop thinking, we stop learning, and we stop growing. 
Instead, we should accept the fact that we are very capable of prejudicial behavior and that it can manifest itself in many different ways. Never let go of that understanding that we are, by our very nature, prejudice. Accepting this removes significant barriers to our own learning. And when situations come up where we are behaving in a prejudiced manner, we are able to deal with it in a constructive way. We allow ourselves to make mistakes, and we use these instances and the feedback from others to learn, to grow, adapt, and keep our prejudices in line. The skeptic community, like any other, is simply a microcosm of the larger world we live in. It suffers from the same challenges that any community will struggle with in terms of its diversity. Prejudice will show itself in many ways, and there will always be those who accept it and those who try to deny it. This is normal and to be expected. However, the issue of prejudice within the skeptic community is an interesting one for me because it's an example of an area where the playing field between skeptics and non-skeptics is leveled significantly. We can all get caught in the same traps, and very often do. And, in my opinion, the issue of prejudice is tied very closely to critical thinking. As skeptics, we pride ourselves on our ability to contain our biases in favor of objective evaluation of information. But prejudice is one area where our biases can often reveal themselves to be stronger than our ability for reason. We become caught up in the very behaviors we associate with non-skeptics, letting beliefs, perceptions, and desires of how we want to see ourselves get in the way of facts and the reality of who we are. How we deal with prejudice is a sobering reminder of how powerful our own human nature is within our lives, whether we are conscious of it or not, and regardless of our level of education. Very often, when issues of prejudice come about, we try to deny it. We believe ourselves to be above it. We say, I didn't make a racial remark, or this practice isn't discriminating, or this isn't my responsibility, or you're being too sensitive over a non-issue. While well, prejudice, bigotry, and discrimination do have their subjective elements, this isn't always just about facts, but the flaw in the thinking is that when we close off communication and deny the issue, we only serve to perpetuate the problem. We stop learning. We fail to behave skeptically and certainly weaken our cause. When something offensive presents itself in, say, a presentation, a blog post, or conversation, and it's brought to our attention, how do we respond? Do we assume an infallible position and claim the offense is unfounded? Do we accuse others of being overly sensitive and disassociate ourselves from any responsibility? How is that being open to our own human nature? How is that an example of objective evaluation of information? How does that promote growth, learning, and change? How does that advance the goals of skepticism? It doesn't. It simply reinforces our desired self-image by creating a reality that supports that bias. And what about claims of a lack of representation of certain minority groups and diversity among leadership and membership within a community? Do we adopt an I got mine attitude and ignore the issue? Do we accuse others of wanting a free ride, a cheat, or an end run around a process that has served others perfectly well? Do we naively assume that an infallibility of leadership will result in an infallible community or organizational structure? How does this promote a positive community image, inclusiveness, and community growth? It doesn't. It's divisive, exclusive, and breaks down the bonds of community which so many have worked so hard to create. As skeptics, we should intuitively see things the other way around. And most of the time, fortunately, we do. But as a community, we're certainly just as capable of making mistakes. Issues of discrimination or, or lack of diversity are often viewed as insults, attacks, and criticisms. It's understandable to see it this way, but in most cases, the feedback originates actually from a place of concern for the community. Largely, these situations arise when underrepresented groups want to be more involved with the community. They want to learn. They want to grow, be more active, offer leadership, and contribute new skills and talents. They want to expand the reach and impact of the community by adding new elements, new perspectives, or new topics that are not being addressed. Through their involvement, they offer greater outreach, greater impact, and greater relevance to the membership and to the public. Isn't this exactly what we want as a community? Isn't this exactly what we want from the public? Of course it is, and we should welcome it. 
Yet, when these underrepresented groups raise issues of their path being blocked, they're often dismissed and ignored, and are told, that's not my problem, or that it's your imagination. Or if it's of a more personal nature, we hear, I'm not sexist, I'm not racist, I'm not responsible, or no one helped me, so go figure it out yourself. We often deny the fact that as a community, we are perfectly capable of doing these things. But we need to remember that it is in our best interest to take these barriers that people are experiencing, regardless of group, and remove them. We're not doing the work for the group or individual. We're not bypassing personal achievement and responsibility when we remove barriers. Yet we often feel that removing barriers is somehow a cheat or end run to a status or level of involvement that wasn't earned. Of course, this is assuming that everyone travels the same path, and we don't. Different barriers are encountered by different groups. We all have a common destination, but the road we travel can be vastly different. Pick any spot on a map and ask people from, say, a thousand mile radius to meet you there. Will everyone arrive at the same time? Of course not, because the reality is that the terrain is different depending on where you start. Some have mountains to navigate, others deserts, an ocean, swamp, traffic, you get the idea. Each terrain presents its own set of challenges, and those challenges have nothing to do with the individuals doing the traveling. They simply exist. Every outreach effort and organizational evaluation needs to be an all-terrain vehicle for its members and its recruits. When portions of our community point out barriers and obstacles in their path, which are preventing their progress, they're not asking for an end run to the top. They're not asking for a cheat. And they're not necessarily attacking or blaming. In all my years dealing with the issues of diversity, I have yet to find a group asking for a handout for something undeserved or that wasn't earned. These groups and individuals are more than capable of achieving the levels of status, involvement, and leadership they want all on their own. They don't need our help for that. What they do need is for those people who are able to assist in removing the barriers blocking their path or at the very least acknowledging and accommodating the rough terrain they must travel to reach that desired destination. It is our responsibility as skeptics to help remove barriers for others which are within our power to remove. Nothing more. And then we sit back and enjoy the benefits of more people joining the ranks of the skeptic community with a diversity of knowledge, experiences, skills, and talents which benefit us all. An awareness of human nature isn't going to eliminate our problems and differences, just as an awareness of germ theory doesn't eliminate disease or illness. But knowledge and acceptance of our own prejudices and human nature gives us a powerful preventative tool in our arsenal to minimize discrimination and promote diversity. And when discrimination does occur, whether in our personal lives, communities, or organizations, we can deal with it in a much healthier and constructive manner. For most people, the bulk of the anger and frustration experienced due to prejudice doesn't come from the act or offense itself. It comes from the response. So whether or not we agree, it's still in our best interest to respond in a constructive, respectful, and civil manner. If you have questions, comments, or would like to share your own tips and ideas on living skeptically, send them to actuallyspeaking at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash factually. Thanks for listening.